Amen. Father, we thank you for a leadership development session tonight. We're asking, Lord, like you empowered the 70, like you energized them, like you prepared them adequately for the work you gave them to do. Empower, energize, refill your servants tonight in Jesus' name. Use every one of us. Let our ministry in every location bring glory to you and salvation to the people who listen to us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're looking at Luke chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. After these things, after what? In chapter 9. Two of the disciples, especially John, in particular John, had seen one person casting out devils in the name of Christ. And he looked at him, sized him up. You're not one of us. You're not one of the twelve. And he said, Master, I saw one casting out devils in thy name. And we forbade him. And we told him not to do so again. And Jesus said, forbid him not. Jesus knew 70 others that John did not know, that James did not know, that the disciples did not know. They saw only one. And they forbade him. And Jesus now, after these events, the Lord appointed 70 others. What the 12 could not do, because the 12 could not cover the whole land. Christ looking forth, Christ looking forward, saw 70, and he chose the 70 empowered the 70 and sent them forth to see one and to forbid him is disadvantageous and Jesus turned disadvantage into advantage in our lives as we confront situations in ministry there will be disadvantages that might be brought in by A or B. Let's endeavor not to concentrate on the disadvantage, but to turn every event, every situation that normally should have brought disadvantage, turn it to advantage in your life, in your family, in your ministry. After these things, the Lord appointed all the seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Delegation is not abdication. That he got twelve, he got seventy, eighty-two. And he could send them forth, did not mean that he will fold his hands, he will shut his mouth, he will close his eyes. He can go to sleep because look at them, 12 plus 70. No, he sent them forth whether he himself should still come. That we have workers does not mean that the coordinator will abdicate and say, I don't want you to work anymore. That we have coordinators does not mean that the group coordinator will say, well, there are enough coordinators to man every pulpit this Sunday. Whether I go or not, it doesn't matter. Uh -uh. 
delegation doesn't interpret you abdication that the states have the overseer the overseer the overseer there does not mean that the general not local general not Lagos general superintendent, not local superintendent, Lagos superintendent, that the general superintendent should not go here and there and there because, after all, all those people are there. Delegation does not mean abdication. And so Jesus said, He sent them out to and two or two by two into every place whither he himself should come look at verse two in verse two therefore said he unto them the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest who knows how expansive the harvest is how great the harvest is how extensive going here and there everywhere there are souls everywhere to be saved and so the lord of the harvest is the one that looks at the whole harvest that he was sent forth laborers into his harvest in verse 3 Verse 3 says, Go your ways, 70, 2 by 2, 35 different places they were going. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Look at that. Lambs, sheep, run away from wolves, naturally, because the wolves will devour, will eat up the sheep and the lamb, naturally. But this is supernatural work. As you go, you find them as wolves outside there. But don't say, because they are violent, because they are murderous, and because they could tear the lambs apart, don't look at them. This is spiritual. You go without fear. You go without panicking. Even though you are as lambs among the wolves, I'm sending you to them. It teaches us that we as preachers, we as evangelists, and we as preachers of the gospel, the people will see outside, looking at their frowns, and looking at their background, and looking at their ability to devour. And the lambs, and we are even no more lambs now. You've been in the Lord uh, for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years. You have gone beyond being a lamb to being a sheep, to being a servant of the Lord. And if the lambs are not to fear the wolves, how much more ourselves will fear no wolf, will fear no foe. You know, when you are afraid, even forget the message that the Lord has sent you to give unto them. When you are panicking and trembling, when you are fidgeting, and when you say, it's a wolf, it's a wolf, it's a wolf. And you're before the wolves. You'll forget the message you want to give to them. You'll forget the power, the anointing, the authority you have. Fear brings forgetfulness. You'll forget who sent you. You'll forget who you are. And you'll forget what you are to deliver. Therefore, he says, I'm sending you forth as lambs. I know they are wolves, but... They will not do anything negative to you. And he came back and the something returned and said, Lord, even the devils and the wolves and the lions and all those people, they were subject unto us through thy name. Amen. Amen. They will be subject unto us in Jesus' name.
hold on now. If the lambs are not to fear the wolves outside, obviously, we are not to fear sheep like ourselves inside the fold. Me, like a shepherd, like a servant of the Lord, should not fear my own members, the sheep within the fold. It's a misnomer. It's something contradictory. When the shepherd who is to feed the sheep becomes afraid of the sheep. Look at that. We're not to fear the wolves outside. We're not to fear the sheep inside the fold. Give me a good amen. amen. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, and heal the sick that are therein. Whatever their sickness, however long the sickness had been, heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. He gave them the same power that they are giving the toil. And they went about and they came back with testimony. You will come back with testimony. The calling and the cost of teaching the kingdom of God. The calling and the cost of preaching the kingdom of God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the mandate and priority of preaching the kingdom of God. It's a mandate and has given us that mandate. And it's the priority. We leave every other thing and we concentrate on preaching the kingdom of God. Number two, the misery, the suffering. For preventing the preachers of the kingdom of God. Those who stand in the way. And they say the preachers of the gospel are not accepted. And they will not open the door to the preachers of the gospel. The misery, the condemnation, the damnation, the judgment upon them, the misery for preventing the preachers of the kingdom of God. Number three, the ministry of power and praise through the king of glory. Let's come to number one. Number one, the mandate and the priority of preaching the kingdom of God. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the priority of the kingdom in Christ's preaching. Number two, the proclamation of the kingdom in Christ-like preaching. Number three, in the perception of the kingdom in clear teaching and preaching. Look at number one. Number one, the priority of the kingdom in Christ's preaching. Mark chapter 1 verse 14. In Mark chapter 1 verse 14 now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Preaching the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings, the gracious message of the kingdom of God. And that was what he focused on. It wasn't diverted to this or to that. It wasn't diverted to the tradition of the Jews. And it wasn't a kind of drawn away to the ideologies of the time. His focus, his concentration, his priority was the preaching of the kingdom of God. And what was the preaching? What was that good news? And what was that gospel of the kingdom? Look at verse 15. In verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. They have been waiting for 
decades, for centuries, that Christ will come, that the Messiah will come, that the King will come. And now the time is fulfilled that the Savior will come. That the one that will bring us out of the wilderness of sin and bring us into the fruitful kingdom of God, he has now come. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the important thing to do is to enter into that kingdom. What will they do to enter? Repent ye. And believe the gospel. The two arms or two branches of what they were to do. Number one, repent. Turn away from your tradition. Turn away from the works of your hand. Dead works that will not save. Turn away from your sin and the works of the flesh. Because they'll damn your soul. Repent. And the other part is believe the good news. Believe the gospel. Believe the great tidings come in from heaven. And that was his priority to preach it in this place and that place and every place. Luke chapter 4. Reading from verse 42. In Luke chapter 4, verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him to, and staged him that he should not depart from them. Many of them had heard the gracious words coming out of his mouth. They said, this is so good, and it's good for us. But if for God, it's good for other people too, other cities too, other places too. But they wanted him to stay with them. Look at the next verse, verse 43. And he said unto them I must preach the kingdom of God priority priority the number one thing never to forget I Christ said must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also for therefore am I sent therefore am I sent to go from this city to that city, from this village to that village. And that's what we're to do today. The mistake the apostles made, the twelve, is that after they received the Holy Ghost, they remained only in Jerusalem. But he told them, You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, the Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. The stage in Jerusalem. And as we go on from chapter 1 of Acts to chapter 21, they told Paul the Apostle, you'll see how many of the Jews here in Jerusalem believe, and they are zealous of the law. If Paul the Apostle had not gone to Antioch, where he was called, where Barnabas, the gospel would have been restricted. But God called Paul the apostle and Barnabas, and he went to the Gentile world, and they went everywhere, even to the seat of power. What he left him for us, maybe you are not able to go everywhere, we understand not everybody will go everywhere, but at least the general superintendent, not legals, local superintendent, should have the understanding of the priority of preaching the gospel here at the headquarters, Jerusalem, there in Samaria, there in Judea, and there in the uttermost part of the world. You agree? I said you agree? Okay. 
You know, sometimes you can agree in word, but you have to agree in action, in utterance. Sometimes when you say I'm not in Lagos, you'll be praying for me. I said when you say or you know that I'm not in Lagos, that I'm here, I'm there, you'll be happy. And you'll be praying for me. Amen. Because you know, really, seriously, we are to go to other cities also, like the Lord Jesus Christ, for therefore am I sent. We will do it in Jesus' name. Let's come to number two here. Number two is the proclamation of the kingdom in Christ-like preaching. That's what he has done exactly. We don't change. We don't modify. We don't mutilate. We don't dilute exactly the gospel of the kingdom that he has preached. We are going to preach the same. Acts chapter 1. We are reading from verse 1. Acts 1 verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began. He began, he began preaching. He began teaching. He began healing. He began delivering. He began calling the lost into the kingdom. He began. There were still many people unsaved in Jerusalem. In Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth, after he had finished his part and he had gone to heaven, what he began both to do and teach. And it is that that the disciples and the apostles were to continue. He began, he began. He began, and they were now to continue to do and to teach. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Until the day in the which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given them commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining before he died, kingdom of God. On the cross, today you'll be with me, remember me, your kingdom in paradise. And then, after his resurrection, the priority, the concentration, the focus, still on the kingdom. And it says, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 8. We're reading from verse 5. The Apostles remained in Jerusalem, but the members and the deacons, Philip and others, went out. Look at verse 5, Acts chapter 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Whatever scatters us and removes us from our local church here, headquarters church here. Maybe it's education that we go to the US, to Canada, to Europe, uh, to South Africa, to different places. The priority as we're there is to keep on preaching the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings 
of the kingdom of God. And Philip was a Samaritan. And in Samaria, he preached Christ unto them. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, and when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. You see the priority in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. How do we enter? Repent and believe the gospel. And the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized with both men and women. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the perception of the kingdom in clear preaching. Clear preaching. How do we perceive the kingdom? What's the kingdom? Romans chapter 14, reading from verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, not meat and drink, not feasts and festivals, but it is righteousness. The kingdom of God, when we preach the kingdom of God, we show the people how to come out of unrighteousness and come into righteousness. Righteousness and peace. Before we have the preaching and the penetration of the gospel, no peace anywhere. On the streets, no peace. In the communities, no peace. In the villages, no peace. Even in the religious assemblies, they're always fighting for one thing or the other. If they don't fight for their relatives to, you know, take position, they fight for themselves to take position. If they don't fight on position, they'll fight on money sharing. If they don't fight on money, they'll fight on, you know, whatever project they have. There's conflict everywhere. Before we hear the gospel, and even those who come who come into gospel churches, if they are just there, but they do not have the establishment of the kingdom of God in them, they still don't have peace. They don't have peace in them, and they don't have peace with the people they interact with. Peace eludes them, because all they can think about is what I want, how I feel, what I want to grab. They are not thinking of the future kingdom of God. And because they do not have peace, they are torn apart on the inside. And they want to tear other people to apart. But when we come and we hear the gospel of the kingdom, we hear the word of salvation. It brings us to righteousness, brings us to peace and joy. And joy, you know, some people, they used to have joy only during their Christmas. When they can drink, when they can have liberty, when they can go to the bad beach, when they can while away and waste away their lives. The only joy they have, the joy of the hypocrite that does not last. But when we hear the gospel of the kingdom, and the king of the kingdom, with his grace, comes into our lives. He brings us righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, verse 20, in verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, 
heresy, verse 21. In verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which commit, they which do, which practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why the gospel, the teaching of the good news of the kingdom, comes to us so that we turn away, we repent from all those things, and now the Spirit enters into us. And the Spirit operates in us and brings forth its own fruit. Look at verse 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit, when it lives in us, when it abides in us, after we've turned away from sin and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved, and the Spirit comes into us. He announces His presence in our lives by witnessing that we are now the children of God. And then fruit will come forth out of our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Those who are not saved, they don't have long suffering. Some of them have, those who try and try, they have short suffering. Some of them who are not even try at all, they have zero tolerance, zero suffering. Whatever does not please them, they don't have grace, they don't have salvation. And they don't have new renewal in their lives. They do not have the possession of the gospel of the kingdom. They have zero suffering, zero tolerance for anybody that will not toe their line, go their way, and do what they want. Some of them, by trying and trying with the gritting of their teeth, they'll try and have short suffering. But when grace comes into our lives, we don't throw in the toil just because, you know, something we don't appreciate is going on. We're not distracted. We're not bothered. We're not pressured because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. The suffering persecution does not take away gentleness from them. That the result of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, entering into us and doing is saving work in our hearts and goodness and faith. Verse 23, in verse 23, meekness, lowliness, and temperance against such there is no law. And in verse 24, verse 24, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and the laws. Let's come to point number two here. Point number two. Remember, we're looking at Luke chapter 10. And we've seen in the first part, verses 1 to 3. And verse 9, that Christ called the 70 and he sent forth the 72 by two, two and two. And he gave them the word of the gospel to go and preach and proclaim and also to heal the sick that are therein in those places. And whatever they did, they should do thoroughly because Christ will still come to those cities they are gone, to those villages they are gone, and they would have seen what they did when they were there. Now, the second part, we're looking at the misery for preventing the preachers 
of the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 10, verse 10. In verse 10, but into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, verse 11, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, will do wipe off against you, notwithstanding. Be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. You can receive, you can reject, but be sure of this, that the messengers who came, the preachers who came, the proclaimers who came, they came to present unto you the glories of the kingdom, the grace in the kingdom, the power of the kingdom, and the possibilities in the kingdom. When you repent, believe, and you enter in. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. He said, when we hear the gospel, there's responsibility. If we accept, if we believe, if we receive, the goodness of the kingdom will be ours. But he says, if we reject, if we neglect, if we throw it away as if we heard nothing, it says it will be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for such a person and so, such a city. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, the works which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 14. In verse 14, but it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Verse 15, and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. There are people that never, never mention hell in their preaching. They think they are very much civilized. They say, I don't want you, you know, drive people into the kingdom through fear, the fear of judgment. Jesus did. He spoke about judgment, spoke about suffering, spoke about damnation. He spoke about hell. In fact, no other person, no other preacher in the whole of the Bible spoke about hell, fire, like the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not hide the truth from the people. He gave them the whole truth. Salvation, damnation. Healing, suffering. Deliverance, being tormented with the devils and his angels. He preached the whole truth. And he spoke about hell. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, he that heareth you, heareth me. He that heareth you, heareth me. Oh, is Peter talking? Yes. He that heareth Peter, heareth Christ. Because Christ gave the message, the gospel to Peter. It's just John. That just John. Uh -uh, not just John. He that heareth John, 
heareth me. Oh, that's just Paul. Uh -uh, not just Paul. He that heareth Paul, heareth me. L let's understand that when the servants of God are sent with the message of God, although those servants are nothing in themselves, but they become the very representatives of Christ. And he says, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despises you, despises me. He that belittles you, belittles me. He that silences you, shut up. You preach too long. You shouldn't be saying that. You want to convert everybody with only one message? Hold on. He that despises you, silences you, despises me, and despises the one that sent me. He that despises me, despises him that sent me. The misery for preventing the preachers of the kingdom of God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the danger of rejecting his messengers, messengers' warnings. Number two, the damnation for not repenting after mighty works. Number three, the destiny for resisting despite miraculous wonders. Number one. Number one, the danger of rejecting his messenger's warnings. It tells us in Jude, reading from verse 7, only one chapter in Jude. Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal, everlasting, forever burning fire. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Those who reject the gospel, those who have the gospel, but they hold it with insincerity with hypocrisy and they do not give themselves to acting on the gospel they have received no repentance no faith in Christ darkness blackness suffering torture torment reserved for them forever Hebrews chapter 2 Reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. Verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. 
Look at number two there. Number two is the damnation for not repenting after mighty works. The damnation for not repenting after such mighty works. Matthew chapter 12 verse 41. In Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Think of Christ. Healing, delivering, working miracles greater than Jonah. Let's now go to his apostles. Think of Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 repenting, believing. Think of Peter Silver and gold are by none. What I have, I give unto thee. Rise up and walk. Miracle. Think of Peter. And as they passed by, they laid the sick on the street. That at the least, the shadow of Peter will come upon them. And they were all healed, everyone. Peter, a greater and Jonas is here. Think of Philip. He came to the city in Samaria. And as he preached the kingdom, demons were cast out. And the sick healed. Jonah never did anything like that. Philip, a greater than Jonas, is here. Look at Paul. And he preached the gospel there. And there was a man, impotent, paralyzed from birth. And as Paul looked at him steadfastly, he knew he had faith to be healed. And he said, without even touching him, stand upright on thy feet. And the man stood up. And he took aprons and handkerchiefs away from the body of Pete of Paul. And he laid on the sick people. And those people were healed. And evil spirits came out. Of them, and Paul, a greater than Jonas, is here. And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because those Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Look at number three there. Number three, the destiny for resisting despite miraculous wonders. The destiny of those people for resisting rejecting the gospel despite the miraculous wonders that took place in their midst. Revelation Chapter 21, reading from verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful, some of the people rejected because they feared the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their leaders. If we accept Christ, if we accept his message of repentance and faith, message of salvation, They'll throw us out of their synagogue. That's why they did not accept fearful. And the unbelieving, and it's the unbelieving that made all those Jews that passed through the wilderness 40 years. They drank miracle water. They ate the manna and they saw mighty manifestation of the power of God. But 
because of unbelief. They were not allowed to get to the land of Canaan. The fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable. And the people that still continued in their abominable practices, abominable traditions, abominable lifestyle, and the murderers, and the mongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it, into heaven, anything, anyone that defileth, those who defile other people by their fleshly practices, those who defile other people to lure them into sensual fleshly work, into sensual emotional thing. All those that defile, it says, neither whosoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie, but the which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those who are get into the kingdom, the sinners, Adam and sinners, incorrigible sinners, untransformed, unchanged sinners. They are nominal Christians. They go to church. They listen to messages. They gather messages that children gather butterflies. But there's no change in their lives. They are abominable, they are defiling, they are liars. It says they will not get to that glorious city that is called heaven. The destiny for resisting despite miraculous wonders. Look at point three here. Point number three, we have the ministry of power. The 70 had gone out two by two. 35 pairs, and they went to every city where Christ himself will come. And they returned, and they gave testimony of the ministry of power and praise through the King of Glory. Luke chapter 10, we're looking at verse 17. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, the joy of victory, the joy of triumph, the joy of success in ministry. It will happen to you. Saying, Lord, Lord, they were not just calling him Lord. He was the Lord of their lives. He was the Lord of their lifestyle. He was the Lord of every step they took. He was the Lord of their heart. He was enthroned in their heart. And there's a difference between just calling Lord, Lord, and not doing what he says, and calling him Lord and doing everything he says with all their heart in obedience, prompt obedience, in obedience, perfect obedience, in obedience, persevering, obedience to the word of God, to the word of the Lord. And he came back with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They didn't have to go for training somewhere. So they will know how to cast out devils. So they will know how to know the names of the devils. No. At the beginning of the chapter, he gave them power, gave them authority over sickness, over disease, and over devils. That's all. No other special training. 
you have his name and he said even the devils are subject unto us through thy name it is the name it's not what we dig up somewhere it's not what we read up somewhere it's not you know methodology and you know this method and this method what is thy name and then the, those devils deceive you and give you names and then you are sweating and trying no even the devils are subject unto us through thy name look at verse 18 in verse 18 and he said unto them i beheld satan as lightning fall from heaven verse 19 behold i give unto your power your habit i said you have it not by feeling by faith not by trying, by trusting. You have it in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Serpents and scorpions will not tread over you. Amen. You will tread over them. And over all the power of the enemy. I didn't hear you there. Yeah. You know, if we knew the promise of God, associated with the power of God, linked up with the performance of God, you will never fear any enemy. Yeah. Because no enemy can stop a centimeter of all the length of your life, of your journey. No devil, no disease, no enemy will stop you in Jesus' name. You may see them, you may not see them. Whether you see them or you don't see them, you will tread over them. You will march over them. But you know the problem? Your enemies, they know the promise the Lord has given you, and they are afraid. You don't know the promise the Lord has given you, and you are afraid of them. And you know, even little children can tell when an adult is afraid, when an adult is trembling. It shows on the face. It reflects in your voice. Even though you are standing, it's like you are empty on the inside. Don't allow the enemy, whatever their stature, whatever their size, wherever they are coming from, don't let them see or sense any fear in you anymore. They are afraid of you. As they are afraid of Christ. Because Christ has said, I give unto you. Lord, I receive. Lord, I receive. You know, when you are afraid, what you ought to do, what you ought to say, you don't do, you don't say. And you don't do it and say it with confidence. But thank God for his grace. If you don't answer, I will not tell you what I wanted to tell you. Yeah. You know, we're having a crusade. Act as if you didn't hear it before. Act as if you are hearing it for the first time. It was 1985. And we're called, uh, you know, a dramatist, Baba Salatio. Help us publicize the crusade. And he did a wonderful job. The Lord bless him and his team. Say amen. amen. And so they gathered people there. And as they gathered people, blind, lame, everybody. And they were going to the stadium through so Larry here. And uh, so the crowd pouring in. And I have been preparing. I'll tell you so that when it comes to your turn, because it will come to your turn. Yeah. You will know how it was done 
you will do it. I'd prayed, I'd fasted, I'd read, I'd listened to, you know, some helpful faith tips. And then the day came, and we were going. I was in the car. The driver, of course, was driving. I was sitting by this side, as I always do. And as I looked out, I saw people on crutches. They were like, I, I removed my eyes. I looked another direction. I don't blame me. That was my first time. I don't do that now. So if you do that, I'm like you, you are like me. And so we got there, and I was thinking, these people are waiting for blind eyes to open. They lame to rise up and walk. I didn't know about that, but I said, I know the salvation message. I'll preach the salvation message with all my heart, all, everything I have. And I preached the salvation message. And I gave the altar call. But I knew the people were still waiting. They were waiting for, what were they waiting for? Miracle. And so, you know, counselors, say, thank you very much. God bless you. Members of choir and ushers who are there. Get the names and write legibly. Inside me, as you know, was saying that, there was uh, what will happen tonight. And so, the time came. If you are going to die, you only die once. And I said, I'll give it all it takes. And so I said, you are sick. I shouted, but internally, there was fear. Raise up your hand. The Lord will heal you today. I didn't say I will heal them. I said, the Lord. Who is going to heal them? And so we closed our eyes and I prayed and prayed and prayed. I didn't know how to stop the prayer because I didn't know what will happen. In the middle of the prayer, I had shout. There was a mother who brought a child, one leg had no bone. It was all flesh. And they'll wind that uh, a kind of fleshly uh, leg around the stick and be hopping. But in the middle of the prayer, when I had half faith, half fear, a miracle happened. God created bone in that leg. And before we said the final amen, the boy threw away the seed and began to walk. And the mother saw that. And the mother began to laugh and cry and jump and dance. I opened one eye. What's happening to them over there? I saw miracle. I said I saw miracle. And so, next I said, anybody there, where are you? God is touching you now. And God touched them. And from half fear to and half fear, I had zero fear, zero fear and total fear. And I pass it on to you. I pass it on to you. Your time has come. Say, my time has come. Behold, behold, I give unto who? You. Power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over, over, over all the power of your enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing shall by any means hurt you in Jesus' name. The ministry of power and praise through the King of glory. Look at three things very quickly. Number one, the power for recovery through kingdom citizens. Number two, the purpose of rejoicing by kingdom citizens. And number three, the praise for revelation to kingdom 
citizens. Look at number one. Number one, the power for recovery through kingdom citizens. Through you and through me. Through me and through you. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God in your ministry. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 17 returned again with joy. What joy will fill your heart? Saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us, unto us, unto, tell me, unto, tell me, 70 people, not one failure among them. Not one failure among them. You will not be the exceptional failure. All of us, even the devils, even the demons, even the diseases, they'll be subject unto you, unto her, unto him, unto me, through the name of the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Their captain, their master, will even lose his power and his position when we go out. Verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. I believe that. I accept that. I claim that fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two, the praise of rejoicing by kingdom citizen. In Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Heaven knows your name. Your names are written in heaven. I said, heaven knows your name. The angels know your name. There is a register in heaven. And you are asking, is my name written there? And Jesus said, yes, your name is written there. What joy we have, our names in heaven, the power of heaven in us, and we go out and nothing shall by any means hurt us, and we just wake up to realize we're the citizens of the kingdom. Heaven recognizes us. Even Satan, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, and what's your name? Even Satan knows you. When you appear, when you stand, they will bow. With the name of Jesus in your mouth, with the confidence of faith in your heart, in your life, they will bow in Jesus' name. Rejoice because your names are reaching in heaven. You know, sometimes we, we have to read. We cannot do without reading. And so we read this book and read that book. That's all right. But when you meet something there, see something there that is not correct, 
you know how to throw that away. In some of the books that, you know, people are preaching, they said nobody was born again before Jesus went to the cross. They said all of them were religious people. Apostles, disciples, everyone. They said they were not born again. Only when Christ got to the cross, only after he said, it is finished. All those who came at that time, only those who were born again. That's a lie of the devil. You didn't answer me. Because Jesus said, V70, their names are written in heaven. How can their names be written in heaven if they were not born again? They were born again. And I am born again like them. And I am born again like them. And I have the name of Jesus. And I have the testimony of the Holy Spirit. You'll be victorious from now on in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, the praise of, for revelation to kingdom citizens. The Lord has given the revelation to kingdom uh, citizens. And the Lord praised the Father because of that. In Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 21, it says, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. The Pharisees, they thought they were wise. The lawyers of the law, they thought they were wise. The scribes, they thought they were wise. The Sadducees, they thought they were wise. But the Father hid all these good, good things away from the self-righteous and the worldly wise. And he says, he read it from them and has revealed them unto babes even so father for so it seemed good in thy sight look at verse 22 in verse 22 all things are delivered to me to Christ of the father and no man knoweth who the son is but the father and who the father is but the son and he to whom the son will reveal him verse 23 in verse 23 and he turned him unto his disciples and said privately he turns now unto you and he's saying unto you blessed are the eyes which see the things ye see. Yeah. The ears that hear the things you hear. The mind, the heart that receives what you receive. Blessed are your eyes. Blessed is your mind. Blessed is your understanding. Verse 24. In verse 24, for I tell you, that many prophets and kings of the old covenant have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Amen? Yeah. If I see what the prophets of old did not see, then I must do more than what the prophets of old did. If Christ is telling me and telling you, blessed are your eyes, blessed are your ears, because you have been privileged to know, to see, to hear, to understand what the old prophet, old time, old testament prophets have not seen and heard, and what the kings have not seen and heard. Our faith should be greater than their own. We have seen something greater. We have seen something higher. We have seen something deeper. Our lives will outshine their lives by far in Jesus' name. 
you must live up to your privilege. You must live up to the provision that Christ has made for you. Now, those people, Moses and Joshua and David and Caleb and Samson and Elijah and Elisha and Samuel and Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, look at where they were. Rise up now and go higher than them. And do higher than them. Rise up, rise up. Blessed are your ears. Blessed is your life. Blessed is your ministry. You have heard. You have seen. You have believed. You will do more than they have done in Jesus' name. Tell the Lord, open your mouth. Bless the name of the Lord. See what you have seen. Hear again what you have heard. Believe what he has given unto you. He called them. The seventy. He called them. Beyond we saw one person, one man casting out devils in your name. We forbade him. They forbade one person. And the Lord raised up 70 beyond the person they were forbidden. Praise the Lord. Count yourself as part of that 70. He sent the 12 out apostles. Maybe you are not an apostle, but all the same, you shall become one of the 70. And say, Lord, I come. And what he gives you, believe. What he gives you, accept. Say, Lord, I am who you say I am. I have what you say I have. I can do what you say I can do. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He chose you. He chose you. Brother, he chose you. Sister, he chose you. And he calls you friend. He calls you a companion. And it says, where you go, I'll be coming there too. Praise him. Thank him. You're the one that called you for a purpose. Sending you forth. To do what you've never done. Activate, activate that faith. Believe that challenge. Accept. Believe. Go forth. They look like wolves. You look like a lamb. Walk by faith, not by sight. Go forth. Go forth. He gave you his name. He gave you the power. He gave you the message, the proclamation. You are not going up. You are not going through your own power, your own strength. You are going forward in the power and the strength and the name of the Lord. No fear. Of any enemy, no fear. Of any wolf, 
no fear of any intimidator. I can do what he sends me forth to do. Preach the kingdom of God. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Preach it in Jerusalem, preach it in Judea, preach it in Samaria, preach it in the uttermost part of the earth, preach it, preach it faithfully, preach it fervently, preach it with focus. Nothing diverting your attention. Preach it persuasively, confidently. Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Tell them Preach passionately, powerfully, persuasively. Call them out of darkness into the light. And heal the sick that are therein. In the name of the Lord, cast out devils anywhere you confront them or they confront you. You have his name, you have his authority. You have the anointing, you have the unction. You'll have the same victory they had, the same triumph they had, Lord. Even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And the Lord will say, I beheld Satan fall from heaven while you were on the evangelistic field. And behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy, of your enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Believe it's for you in particular. And you're going to go forth and preach, not as usual, but you'll preach in an uncommon way. In an uncompromising way, courageous, confident, Christ like. I 
and you'll carry the joy of a successful minister the joy of a prevailing ministry it go with power not weakness You go with this authorization. And you go with authority. And his name in your mouth will get sinners repenting. The seek recovery. The demonized delivered. Make this moment a turning point in your life, in your ministry. Make this time a turning point your ministration believe like you never believed Minister in faith like you have never done. Courageously tread on those serpents and scorpions don't let anything any personality coming from Satan tread on you walk on you and not allow the power of any enemy Coming from whatever direction, don't allow that power to prevail over you. Prevail, overcome. No more fear, no more cowardice, no more trembling, no more fretting, worrying before the enemy, any enemy. Stand. Steadfast in the Lord. Victory is for you. Receive what He has given you. Manifest what He has ministered to you. Pray like never before. Preach like never before. Pursue like never before. There's victory ahead.
In Jesus' name we pray. Say, Lord, I have what you say I have. Say, Lord, I can do what you say I can do. Say, Lord, I will go where you say I should go. I know. I know. I have the power. I have the authority. I will tread on serpents and scorpions. I will tread over all the power of my enemy. I believe. I believe. I believe. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. If you believe it, say that again. If you believe that, let heaven hear you. In Jesus' name we pray. Raise up those hands, Father in heaven, we thank you for the seventy that you sent forth. And Lord, you are sending forth every brother here, every sister here. All the overseers, all the leaders, all the workers, all the group pastors, all the local pastors, everyone. Lord, I pray like never before, your power will descend on everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, grant everyone of the kingdom cities, grant them a new refreshing, a new anointing, a new auction, a new power in their soul in their spirit, in their heart. And as they go forth, they go forth in power. Their preaching will bear fruit. Their life will bear fruit. Their family will bear fruit. The local church, their over, will be fruitful in Jesus' name. From the headquarters here, to every state, to every nation, to every, every region, and to every locality. Everywhere your people stand and declare your word, there will be conversions in Jesus' name. And there will be spectacular healings in Jesus' name. Lord, they themselves, we ourselves, every brother, every sister, we're totally free from every power of darkness. And we go forth in the name of the Lord. Victory. Triumph. Power. Performance. Accomplishment. Joy in ministry. We'll follow everyone in Jesus' name. Confirm each in every life. Confirm each in my life. Confirm each in my life. Confirm each in my life. In Jesus' name we pray.